Okay, good afternoon. The, this is time to present our keynote speaker, Sharma Rose. Um, she is a, a professional in the industry. She is known within the industry as a business security leader with a unique blend of technical and business acumen. She's also a base jumper. And you know, when we work with info, information security, info security, we talk also in terms of risks. When you do base jumping, you actually have more or less the same. You have, uh, I think, a, one out, a chance of one out of six to get an accident. So you also think of a couple of risks before jumping. And I think this is what her presentation will be about, um, what base jumping taught her about risk in general. Shama, the floor is yours. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm really short, so I can't really stand behind this thing and talk to you guys. So I'll probably move around a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, basically what Clement said, I, I, uh, I want to talk to you guys about what base jumping taught me about risk and, and how I think it applies to our field and in information security. And even though they're totally, you know, two different disciplines, there are a lot of similarities that go on. Um, so I want to, I know, and I know that you guys are really, this is a really technical audience and you guys are going to get sit through like tons of like really intense technical talks. and. I'm gonna tell you right now that this isn't gonna be one of those. <laughs> I'm gonna talk in uh, themes and high level concepts and, and, and kinda leave you with a question at the end of this. Like I, I wanna talk about our overall approach to risk in general. And you know, as people, as you guys sit through these talks and as you present these talks, um, I'm curious about after seeing my talk what you think of risk as you're sitting through these talks. <laughs> and I'll go into more in depth about that, but um, I, I'm gonna talk about predicting and analyzing and reacting to risk specifically. Um, and that's me there, that was taken last year in Idaho. That's my favorite place to base jump because it's legal. <laughs> um, it's about 480 feet and it's about five seconds to impact, so um, that's, your reaction time, and that's when you have to make some good life-saving decisions. Um, okay, so who am I? Um, Clement gave a you know high level, but I started out as a penetration tester um, a while ago, and I was I used to live in Seattle and work for Leviathan, and I did that for um, I don't know about five years, and then I got bored of that, and I wanted to do more, and I wanted to. Um, really talk to people and influence from the top down and from the bottom up and really just get things done. And I got sick of throwing reports over the fence. So I started getting to more of uh, security management, program management, um, specifically application software security. Um, so um, now uh, I took the summer off to base jump and skydive <laughs> and uh, I now work in the industry a little bit, in the skydiving industry. I like, film a lot of commercials and do stuff on camera and whatnot, which is kind of fun side gig when you're not doing security. But I've just accepted an offer now to, to be the head of security for a financial firm based out of Chicago and Los Angeles. Um, and I'm excited about that. Um, so, uh, embracing risk, what I hope to, to bring to you guys in this talk is really to, to tell you, you know, a little bit about base jumping and why it's risky. Obviously, we know that it's, the risk there is a risk of death or, you know, loss of life or limb or something really catastrophic. Um, and then compare that to risk and security, how we're dealing with risk and security, how we're assessing it, um, and, and just day to day, how we are reacting to it, too. Um, and then move beyond that and kind of apply those base principles to security and how, this is the question that I want to leave you guys with, how we should be doing it differently. Okay, so um, <laughs> as a skydiver and base jumper, I think about risk very differently because if I do something wrong, I die. I have, you know, five seconds or a millisecond to figure out what's wrong and fix it or else I'm going to lose my life. Um, so when I think about risk, I think about it in those kind of, you know, life terms and that's, that's really important, I think, 
as security people, we should be thinking about that as well. We don't think about that so much. We think about loss of database or loss of credit card numbers or loss of something kind of arbitrary that can be fixed. Um, so um, I think that, um, you know, as someone who's like going to lead security for a company, I, it's my job to ensure safety and ensure re risk reduction, right? Um, and that's all your guys' jobs too, to, no matter how technical you are or how high level you are, at the end of the day, that's your job. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of BASE 101 so you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, BASE stands for building antenna span and earth. Um, Building is, of course, what you see there on the left. That's my buddy, Marco, who jumped into <laughs> New York City. He's the guy that jumped off of the World Trade Center, if you guys have heard about that. He got in a lot of trouble, um, slammed with some felonies and whatnot. Uh, I took that picture. That was the first base jump that I ever saw in person, and it's really what got me started. It was the coolest thing that I had ever seen, and I never wanted a base jump before I saw that, and I was like, holy shit, that was so cool. Um, antenna is um, less frequently photographed because they're a little bit harder to come by and uh, they're, not, they're not really um, easily accessible. Um, span is a bridge, obviously. That to me on my first base jump and uh, I was scared out of my mind. I can barely see over the railing <laughs> and my job is to climb over the railing and jump off of that. My whole body is literally screaming at me to stop. <laughs> Don't do that, you're gonna die. Um, and Earth is what you guys are probably most familiar with. You guys probably may have seen, maybe on you know sports channels or CNN sometimes, wingsuit base jumping, the squirrel suit stuff. Um, that's my friend Matt and Ian. Ian died a couple of months ago base jumping in Turkey. Um, and that is the most frequent way that people die base jumping. And that's, I'll explain why in a minute. <laughs> Um, so this is why it's dangerous. It is the absolute most dangerous sport out there. Um, one in six people uh, have the, one in 60 people uh, die base jumping. Those odds are really bad. Um, that's one in 100,000 jumps. I'm sorry, one in 2,000 jumps. In skydiving, it's one in every 100,000 jumps. Um, about five of my friends have died in the past six months. Um, <laughs> you don't look around at your you know, security buddies sitting next to you and think, well, they're gonna die and they're gonna die and they're gonna die tomorrow because they're gonna go do something risky. Like that's not really the reality of information security. Um, and that's out of about 270 deaths total. Um, and that's my buddy, Josh. He, <laughs> he's, 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 was this massively tall dude with a huge beard and rocked a massive big pink wingsuit like a boss. Like <laughs> that is about as manly as you can get, I think. Um, so now that we understand how risky this is, probably the next question is why the hell would you do that? Um, so like I said, I didn't start out wanting to base jump. I started base jumping because I saw it and it looked cool and I wanted to be that cool. Um, I started thinking about managing risk and managing fear. It became like a mental hack to me. Like how can I, um, in an adrenaline induced situation like that, control all of my feelings and emotions and determine if this is a really risky situation that I should be walking into. Um, and, and that was cool to me. I think like mastering adrenaline management is something that human beings don't really do today because everything is so safe all the time. You know, you get in the car, you buckle a seatbelt, you kind of don't remember your drive to work. Do you ever do that? You zone out on the way to work? Like, that's how safe, even though, by the way, driving is way more dangerous than skydiving. <laughs> um, so for me, it was a way to look at my brain, deconstruct it while having a ton of fun. Um, there's huge rewards for base jumping. Like, not only do I get an adrenaline rush, I get a total dopamine injection whenever I jump. So. All of my senses become heightened. I can smell better, I can see better. 
I can hear better, everything else is just like elevated. Um, so that's pretty cool. And just like security, we've got awesome community. Like you guys do really special, interesting stuff that you know 99% of the rest of the world just doesn't get, but thinks is really cool. And you bond around that so much, right? Like that's such a cool thing that you guys get to share and you go to parties, you go to conferences and you know, skydivers and base jumpers also have these kind of things that we call them boogies. Um, also, um, it kind of gave me a reality check on life, right? Like, I was neck up for so long, I just sat behind my computer, sent lots of emails and spreadsheets and talked about risk and security and stuff, but this kind of shed a different light on me and that was, uh, that was really fun for me. So, how we assess risks. Um, we have the known risks and the unknown risks, right? Like we've got this entire list of stuff that could possibly go wrong, that does go wrong on a frequent basis. And then we've got this list of countermeasures that we counter everything, all of those risks with. Um, so that, that's kind of one way we look at it, known and unknown, like shit happens, you, you know, stuff's gonna go wrong all the time. So you have to have the mental ability to do that. Um, the most important part of risk management for base jumpers is mental. Um, having the ability to realize when you shouldn't do something or when you should do something or when you should not put your ego into it and when you should just back down is a big deal. Um, the other one is skill level, right? Like knowing when you should do a base jump or you shouldn't do a base jump because it's too hard for you. Um, there's a lot of really technical base jumps out there. It's not just putting on a parachute and running off a cliff. Like, that would be really, really bad. We're looking at the weather. We're looking at things called ghosts. Um, so a ghost is, um, imagine a stream going by me here, and there's just kind of a weird ripple on it. That can mess with my parachute, so I don't want to jump off and put myself in a risky situation uh, under canopy, because you die under canopy. Um, So base jumping is weird because I think it's one of the one of the only real sports or things you can partake in that um, as you get safer, your risk of death increases, if that makes sense. Um, so the people that are dying are not the newbies. The people that are dying are the guys that are flying through the cracks um, in their wingsuits about this high from the ground going 120 miles an hour. Um, and that's because they've gotten to a point where all of their um, safety precautions are dialed, right? They're willing to take an extra risk because they know how to save themselves. But a lot of times that's way too much risk to take on and there's a real problem where these people are dropping like flies, right? So um, the base industry as a whole needs to understand, you know, when they should just back off. And wingsuit base jumping uh, is one of those things. I don't know if you guys saw the original Point Break movie, but they're making a new one, and it's coming out um, on Christmas Day, and there's a bunch of wingsuit base jumping in it, and I can guarantee you that there's gonna be a massive influx of young kids that wanna go do that now, and that's really terrifying. Um, so I think the good thing about this for security is that security doesn't suffer from this problem. Like, we're not, we're not getting, I mean, maybe it's debatable, I don't think we're getting a lot worse um, as we as we move forward, I think we are making a lot of really good strides. Um, um, so, what actually kills base jumpers? This is in this is what I think in order of priority. What makes people go in, as we call it? Um, number one is ego. That is um, the mental aspect of it that I told you about. This is when we don't have the wherewithal within ourselves to to create a safe environment. Um, complacency, that's when we, we do this so often or nothing happens and we kind of have this thought in our mind that we can't actually die from this or we can't actually get injured. Complacency is really what kills people most of the time. Um, the others are, of course, malfunctions and gear failure. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Um, my buddy Ian, who um, I showed you on the other slide, um, was doing a base jumps that he does a lot. He was doing a quad gainer off of something and his parachute happened to be wet. So as he rotated 
um, the parachute took half of a second longer to open, and so as he rotated, it wrapped him up and just kind of <laughs> sunk him down. Um, so that's one of those like micro risks uh, that shit happens stuff that that we have to think about a lot. Um, the other one is uh, objects. That's, those are the things that's the base. Objects are called buildings, antennas, fans, and earth. Um, and also the environment, too. OK, so that now that you have your base 101, and I hope that I didn't scare the shit out of you, it is actually really cool. Um, why do I want to talk about this at a security conference? Um, I, like I said, I think they're really similar. Um, hacking is also like very fun and sexy and cool. You get dopamine rushes from it as well. Like, you know, when you're sitting at your computer and you're like, "Oh yeah, I got this. This is like this is this is going," and you get that like really good rushy feeling. Um, you know, that's the same thing that I'm experiencing when I'm base jumping, um, except base jumping is just a little bit <laughs> more up there. Um, it's also very risky and edgy, you know, base jumping is illegal, hacking has been and can be in some ways illegal, um, it's pretty nefarious, you get to feel like you're doing some sneaky shit sometimes. I'm sorry if I'm swearing, I hope you guys are okay with that. Um, breaking and entering, there's a lot of that going on. Um, I think a lot of urban explorers will, will relate to the, the high that you get when you get on top of a building. Um, so. Aside from the fact that they're just similar, um, I think about risk when I'm base jumping. I think about risk when I'm at work, when I'm sitting in meetings with my stakeholders and I'm trying to explain to them why the, all of these vulnerabilities mean something to them in a way that, that has impact on them. Like I want them to understand that this risk is real. Um, So how are we dealing with risk and security? Uh, I think this is, this is the thing that's like constantly popping up in my mind as I'm, as I'm working. And I'm, I, I don't know how many times you've, you guys, and maybe you guys don't feel this way, but I feel a lot of times like, why are we paying attention to this problem? Is this really the issue? Is this, is this what is going to sink this company? Is this is what going to make all my end users, you know, commit suicide, like, or, you know, like that happened in the Ashley Madison case, not all of them, but some of them did. Um, and I think, I think that our analysis of this risk is misaligned in a lot of ways, and uh, I'll explain why. So obviously, <laughs> there's a massive business around risk. Um, it, it pays a lot of our bills, and we've created all these products and all this uh, stuff to kind of outline what risk is and what it means. Did you guys see this cyber DEFCON, DEFCON cyber thing that came out the other day? It's like this ridiculous company and they produce a lot of spreadsheets and circles and graphs and in the center of it it says risks and they have DEFCON cyber TM, like they've, you know, they've made it a, something that we should really pay attention to. Uh, and I look at this and I go, I don't even know what that means. That, that means nothing to me. If I was a CEO and that was supposed to mean something to me in terms of what risk is in my environment, I would not know how to interpret any of that. Um, so I also think that the internet and security and software is this massively new thing. It really is still new. And we as human beings are trying to understand how it fits into, you know, we're not being chased by saber-toothed tigers anymore, so how do we assess this risk stuff? Um, this is more of cyber, DEFCON, DEFCON cyber stuff. Um, somehow, this flowchart is supposed to tell me what's going on, but I wanna know what risk means. Like, they're saying that we can take all these vulnerabilities, we can prioritize them, we can do something about them. That's great, but what does that mean? Like, what's the risk? What are we actually protecting? We don't even know. The question of what we are protecting is not actually there. Um, and this stuff, this is like, this is stuff that we produce frequently. And we do it in multitudes of ways. There's tons of spreadsheets like this out there. I, I will admit that I've, I've made tons of this stuff. It's got red boxes. It's got green boxes. It means that we're good. It means that we're bad. Who knows? Um, and. The purpose of it is to communicate upwards to our CEOs or management or stakeholders 
where we're at. Are we secure or are we not secure, right? Like that's the question that we're asking here. But the point is, is that there's no one size fits all risk profile for all of our uh, various companies and assets, right? Like there's nothing that we can plug and play into this risk stuff. So, and here's why I think it's a little misaligned. Um, I don't know if you get, can you guys see that text? It was really bad. Um, the top one says the CISO agenda, right? So, so the risk and where we're at and where, it's, and where we're supposed to be, it's all coming down from the, the CISO, I think, right? Like, he's the one that's telling us from various sources how good we're doing. Um, and I found that, and I think that, and I'm a leader in security too, so I'm responsible for this as well, but I think that like there's an agenda going on in the CISO suite. <laughs> they want certain things funded and they want to, to get their bonus and of course like they're gonna make the company look good when they can, so they might communicate up to the board that we're doing pretty good. Um, I've definitely seen things like red team pen tests miscommunicated up um, and that scared me a lot because the communication was, well, you know, they didn't breach us that much and we caught it. But the truth was is that we found out that we were like an M&M structure. We had a lot of squishy insides and a lot of sort of hardish outsides and we were still totally breachable. We just didn't have enough time, you know? So th that kind of stuff scares me a little bit. It creates a false sense of security and creates a false sense of accurate risk. Um, the other thing is compliance. Uh, I also think compli compliance creates a false sense of uh, understanding of where we're at too because, well, for many reasons, I don't know how you guys feel about compliance, but I hate doing it. I think everybody hates doing it. But every system outside of the compliance world doesn't get looked at because people are too busy focusing on all this compliance stuff, right? And everybody doesn't like doing it. And on top of that, I don't know how often we've said we're doing it, but we're not really doing it. We just have bought something and put it in place and have not configured it, but we're doing uh, file integrity monitoring, sure, right? <laughs> um, and that's the same thing with these tests too, like, right? Like we passed it, we, we're good, right? Um, no, because we excluded a shit ton of IP addresses in our scan range. So, <laughs> and then we're communicating that out to banks and we're communicating, um, you know, that in our quarterly reports. So we're getting all these like, we're clean, we pass stuff, but it's not actually true. Um, also, major breaches, I think, is something where risk is aligned. Like, if you look at all the breaches in the past year or so, AFSI Madison, you know, Grindr, um, Sony, OPM, all that stuff, I, I can guarantee that as these companies were thinking about the information security programs, that the cases like where these companies ended up after the breach was not something that was ever outlined in their security plans, even something remotely. I mean, I don't know. You tell me if Ashley Madison uh, really thought that, you know, their consumers were gonna be, you know, actively harmed. And even that third order, um, <laughs> the third order fallout that was happening with that stuff, like the, the families, you know, families getting upset and all this stuff, which you can argue is not the company's responsibility, but in some ways it is, because if they're actually trying to protect their users, which they should as a company, then they should be thinking about that stuff as well. Um, asset definitions, obviously we don't, like it's a known problem in security that we don't know what all of our assets are, that's fine, um, but it's difficult to, um, really understand our environment when we don't include people and reputation of individuals in our, in our asset classifications, which we should. Um, we should also be thinking about life, not just about every single technology piece. Um, resource saturation, we're either paying too much attention to or not enough attention to certain pieces. Uh, I've seen breaches where entire IT teams are spun up, literally everybody's hands on, which when you think about it, it's great, right? It's great to get everybody's attention and eyes on this stuff and fix the problem, but at the same time, everything else is being left to the wayside. The business isn't functioning as it should because it's stuck on security. Um, I saw stuff like this in response to Heartbleed, 
And it was cool how fast we got stuff taken care of and fixed, but at the same time, it was like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other security issues that we needed to pay attention to as well. Was Heartbleed the thing that we should have been paying attention to? Wasn't that, isn't that what got the, the Pony Award for the most hyped bug or something? I mean, yeah, it's a problem, but there's lots of other problems too. Um, I also think that we're, we're letting Twitter define what, what we should be focusing on a lot of the times. It's like someone says something on Twitter and then it gets put in a blog and then that's a huge deal and then we have to go fix this problem and we don't really know if that's really impacting our environment that much, but, but we gotta pay attention to it. Um, do you guys watch Mr. Robot? It's so good. <laughs> if you don't watch it, you should watch it. Uh, this was one of my favorite quotes, um, I think from episode either seven or eight. But she says, solving the world's problems one spreadsheet at a time. And he says, hey, it's either suits like me or the government, right? <laughs> uh, how many guys, have you guys seen stuff like this? This is, um, I think this came from like PWC or something like that. And it, it outlines all the risky stuff that we need to answer questions for. And it's tab after tab after tab after tab after tab of risk stuff. Um, and after filling out this massive spreadsheet, it's followed by days and days and days of interviews, not just with me, but with everybody else in the IT department. So when I look at this spreadsheet, I see a bunch of stuff like processes, tools, um, how teams are laid out, how are we doing, um, how are we ensuring you know, software security, how are we ensuring network security, incident response, and so forth, which is great. Those are all the cornerstones of information security. But what I don't see is that it doesn't handle anything outside of that, and it's debatable whether information security should, but it, we, sh we should at least be considering it, right? Um, this is where I think the risk continuum is off. Um, we've got those fluctuating assets and definitions. We don't know what should be protected and what is protected and what we should be paying attention to uh, or what the business cares about paying atten attention to um, at all. So it's, it's not easy to keep a list of stuff, right? Um, who's deciding what's important? Is it the CTO? Is it the end users? Is it security? Is it uh, the PCI council? Is it something else? Um, so, these asset definitions exist for basic technology, but nothing outside of that. We've got SOCs and HIPAA uh, compliance, but not what's impacting someone's life. Um, I really think that information security is not just an IT problem or a data problem or anything like that. It's, it's really a business and a life function. This is far outside of just security or outside of um, IT programs. I also think that um, the risks don't align with actual threats, like the thing that I have a problem grasping when, when people, like if you do a keyword search on your Twitter feed and look for the word risk or anything like that, you see people just throwing the word out like crazy. There's a risk, there's a risk, there's a risk, but I don't really know what the actual threat is. There's no correlation between risk and threat. It doesn't make much sense to me. Like I get that this vulnerability is risky, but why? Um, and base jumping for every risk that I have, I have a threat that I know about. I know, ex I know exactly what's gonna kill me at any given time and it's easy for me to make a decision on what I should do with that risk. Okay, so <laughs> based on all that whining and moaning, um, here's what I think we should be doing a little bit differently. Um, as technology is getting more personal, obviously we're huge into the social era. We've got Grindr and Tinder and Facebook and everything like that that's really impacting and people are living their lives on these platforms. Um, we need to start reevaluating that risk continuum and making sure that we're putting that, that life part, social part into our, into our risk stuff uh, and not just black and white technology, vulnerabilities, risk goes beyond that. Um, and, and I also think that we should be embracing risk, right? Like risk is cool. We wouldn't be here if we didn't like risk. I wouldn't base jump if it wasn't risky. It would be really boring. You wouldn't hack stuff if you weren't, you know, in some way fearful of getting caught, like, right? <laughs> or 
or breaking something because you can. Um, so you guys remember this graph from base jumping. Um, and I said, what actually gets base jumpers killed? And I think it's really similar to what actually gets us breached. Um, ego, culture, uh, priority. Um, these are coming down from our CISOs. These are coming down from our board. This is coming down from our C-level executives. They're the ones that set the priority and what we should be paying attention to. Um, that CISO agenda, uh, a lot of times, can and cannot get us breached or it can be a, mean a big difference in how um, we react to stuff. Uh, I was involved in a very large breach um, a while ago and the CISO used it as uh, an excuse to cry wolf whenever he could, you know, like, oh, do you remember that breach? Like, do you look, this is, you gotta pay attention to this, you know, um, which that's his, that's his call, he can do that. But, you know, if you do it all the time like that, you really just get no attention whatsoever. Um, complacency too, complacency, complacency means like, we're getting so used to our environment that we lose our justified paranoia in a lot of way. And I like, I, it's fearful of me to say that like security people are not paranoid, <laughs> but I think in a lot of ways we can be about a lot of stuff. Um, and, th and this is manifesting itself in like the IT teams making security take a back seat. Like they, you know, they really don't think security is a priority in a lot of ways. And that's de definitely due to complacency. Um, in base jumping, we have something called target fixation. And that is when we pay attention so much to something that we actually make it happen. I don't want to call it manifesting because it's not really that. But um, for example, a buddy of mine um, did a base jump and he was fine. Like everything opened fine. He was flying his parachute and he flew directly into a flagpole. <laughs> we were like, why did you do that? What happened to you? And he was like, I couldn't stop staring at it. And he, <laughs> that's what happens. You know, we do that in security as well. It's, it's pretty stupid, but we do it. Um, uh, malfunctions in gear, this is obviously like vulnerabilities in software. This is stuff that we can always count on happening. Um, this is where the breach actually comes from. Um, and also objects um, and in the environment, um, maybe something's misconfigured or whatever. But my, my point here is that, you know, base jumpers get killed long before they ever do the base jump we get breached way before our data is actually leaked. And these are the reasons why. Um, and the risk continuum as I see it now is, exists on the left, right? Like we talk about technology and information. We talk about operational and physical risk. And I duplicated that. <laughs> and then what I think we should be paying attention to on, is on the right, right? Like hazard and event stuff. You know, I had to deal with anonymous threatening the NFL and how do we secure that? Like, did we, before that we never thought about physical security and how it exists for the network and stuff. Like that was not something that we considered at all. Um, market and economic stuff and also life and reputation. Um, systematic risk reduction. Um, so for every single risk that I have, I have a piece of gear that does something to counter it. Um, Engineering is the first key to systematic risk reduction. You guys know that. You guys know that building software safe in the first place is the best way to keep it safe, even though that may change over time. Um, and also execution is, is as well, right? Like I need, I would never jump off a cliff if I didn't know that my gear was going to work the way I wanted it to work. And then I have to do it the way it's supposed to be done. I have to jump off the cliff and not mess it up. I can't barrel roll. I have to actually go off stable. Uh, we need to do this when we're deploying software as well. Um, risk enumeration um, and countermeasures, right? Like we we list out we list out our risks, but we don't list out how to fix them, or we kind of do, but not really. Um, and then we don't align them with the actual threats. I really think that risk registers should have an associated threat register um, to go with it. So. Uh, I do think that we should be bringing on risk in our environments. This is a tweet that Adam Ely uh, posted a few weeks ago, and I love it. He said, don't jailbreak because of some risk. We should say, cool, a risk. Let's work to reduce that risk and be free to jailbreak. Um, so there's lots of talk about self-defending software these days, which I think is pretty cool. Um, in my skydiving rig, I have 
basically a self-defending device that if for some reason I get knocked out or I reach a certain speed and altitude, then my reserve parachute automatically deploys and saves my life. Um, it's pretty cool if we could have stuff like that in, in security as well. There's, I think self-defending software is defined as something like software patching itself in, in, the, in the event of a threat or a risk or something like that. Um, I also think risk breeds a lot of innovation, right? Like we've got a lot of stuff has come out of our security field um, helping bring security to, or helping bring software to a more robust place, and that's really cool. Um, we should use it as a, instead of trying to eliminate it immediately, use it as an excuse to innovate and build up something else around it. So be a risk taker and assessor. So take the risk and then be okay with it. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, is critical in base jumping, and that's my mentor on the left, he's a total ninja, is reaction time. And I've talked about um, uh, reaction time in base, like every microsecond counts, like something goes wrong, you literally, your parachute opens towards the wall instead of away from the wall, you have about a second to get away from that wall. Literally, um, I see in security, especially in, in response teams, them having a really difficult time communicating and understanding the environment and trying to figure out what's going wrong at any given time. And that's largely due to a lack of coordination with you know, your technical operations teams or understanding the systems, the asset enumeration, classification. Um, and, and also, I feel like there's a lot of stonewalling from IT teams in this part. They don't actually want you to know what's going on with their environments because they're terrified that you're going to tell them to do something about it. Um, all right, I think that is it. Any questions? No, come on. One question. Humor me. So do you have any advice that's actually working at scale? So for example, um, a lot of advice kind of makes sense, but then um, if you think about um, you know, a typical enterprise risk list have hundreds of things um, in it, and so then tracking each threat against it is a massive, massive effort, mm -hmm. and it's it's just a lot of it's a lot of brain power to to spend that. Yeah, I mean, do you have any hard and fast rules, or it's a, it's a big problem that has no solution? I, I, honestly, like lists of vulnerabilities mean absolutely nothing to me as as a as a business leader. I, they mean a lot to me as a security person, but as someone as someone who's like trying to secure an environment, I don't want a list of vulnerabilities. You know, there's gotta be some insight into it and some context around it, right? And I think that's where understanding what it is that we care about matters. But to, again, to give you an example, so I, I'm, I'm a suit, no jacket, but that's what I basically do. And uh, my customers have no idea what their assets are, but they can get a list of vulnerabilities. So should you, what, what, what would you say? Should they? discard that or should they take some action to that? I mean, none of the, the, the people I work with have any grasp on totality, for example. Yeah. I mean, doesn't the list of vulnerabilities and what the assets are and what they mean, shouldn't that be the end goal, right? Like it shouldn't be like, it shouldn't be, here's all my vulnerabilities associated with this server. It should be, here's all these vulnerabilities with this server that does this really important thing that we should be caring about or not. This is something that never sees the light of day, who cares? So, but to, to, to finish, my, do you have any hard and fast rules that you would suggest? You know, there's a lot of good stuff in there. If there's a takeaway point, what, what, what could we take home? I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. I mean, it's kind of a vague question, like, I, I mean, in a way, so it's hard to answer.
I don't know. I mean, I've done like the traditional threat modeling and whatnot, which is cool, and it, it lists out good stuff. Um, I don't know. I've used Microsoft threat modeling tool before. <laughs> But I don't know if I would paint that picture in using that tool for you know a board, for example. Like something I never thought about was when I was working for um, uh, a news, a big media company um, that had a news arm was protecting sources, right? Like I, I, I thought like, okay, I'm working for an entertainment company. I don't need to care about nation states. But I never thought that a nation state was a threat until I actually got it. So, you know, we started creating use cases around that. The question was, what are your thoughts on transitioning from a technical role to a leadership role and what mine was like? Um, mine came out of necessity and fear. <laughs> um, I was working for Leviathan at the time in 2005, which is a super small consulting firm of about 10 people or something. And um, everybody was really disorganized and communications to customers were terrible and our reports looked bad. And, and so there was really a need for somebody to come and start managing that stuff. So um, I started managing all the engagements that were going in and out of the, of the company at that time. Um, and that taught me how to manage people, <laughs> you know, security people that were, you know, didn't want to get up for meetings and whatnot. Um, and I liked it, you know. I, I, like, I honestly, like, loved the technology side of things, too. Like, I miss pen testing, but, um, and I feel like, you know, a total management dork standing up here in front of you guys and not a pen tester anymore, but at least I have some cred back in the day. Um, no, I, don't, I mean, it depends on what you like to do, right? Like, management's not easy. It's super hard. You know, I think it's, it's one of the hardest things you can do in security. All right, thank you. Uh, let's give a warm applause to Siyama. Thank you.